Gaffer, first thing, thank you for agreeing to do this interview on your COVID battle. I suppose we should start at the very start, shouldn't we? Managing during the, during the early stages, it was an unknown for everyone, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, um, I, I, I got away with it really early on, I think. I didn't have to deal with any of the things that, that Aaron had to deal with, um, you know, supported by Dave and, and the rest of the staff, the other boys. For me, early on, it was. Um, I remember before I came up to Shrewsbury that I ended up having a, a COVID test halfway up. I think it was halfway up the M5, um, the day before I arrived. So um, I was going to say, thankfully, that was clear. Mind you, that didn't help me in the long run, did it? But um, yeah, so I I got lucky with that really. I mean, the only inconvenience we had really were were masks, um, in and around the changing rooms, but we didn't have to. Uh, get into small numbers at the time, you know, the, the, the bubble of six or or whatever, you know, training out on in small groups out on the training ground. So I got lucky with that really, which was, which I suppose it was important considering the position we were in because we ended up getting a real good month into the players. But like I said, the only thing we had to deal with was masks in and around the changing, changing areas and porter cabins away from home or, you know, make do changing rooms but you know that that really was uh, quite small when we look at how much it grew after that yeah other clubs had breakouts so to speak we had one ourselves what were your thoughts when some of our lads started getting in i think the first one matty miller being yeah. away from the camp yeah i mean yeah matthew was the first one which was you know it was always going to be someone whoever whoever started it really and then i remember matthew being away he missed one midweek game i think and that's when it all sort of kicked off for us, really. And then we had three other lads that tested positive, I, I think, if I can recall. And then we had the game called off against Crew, And we actually trained at the stadium on the Friday. This is quite key, I think, for all those people that are out there now that are not suffering from COVID, have not had it. Um, and maybe for those people who have had it so people always say to you where do you think you caught it you're never ever going to know wherever you search you will never be able to find where you caught it however i think there's one important thing here i think it's when you're fatigued when your immune system is very very low because i believe that um i never thought i would catch covid never never thought that I would have always said I'm strong enough fit enough for my age that I'll be fine I've never suffered with coughs and colds anything like that there's never been ever an issue for me in my life with that so to get Covid I would have said no chance and um, and for all those people that are thinking that do manage to watch this think of no chance please don't think no chance if you work on the on the side of every chance that'll be the thing that will keep you safe so i remember being around the changing rooms and all of that business and and um we were getting directions from the government about wash your hands for 20 seconds i mean the lads used to joke that i used to wash my hands every 20 seconds <laughs> so i was really surprised when i caught it but i think when you catch it i think you can get the symptoms you can get the symptoms and it, and it doesn't really grow into anything. And I actually think that probably, because there wasn't any testing then at all, which was really, really tough, I think, on, on sort of League One, League Two. I think the Championship had started to be tested and Premier League was. I don't, I don't necessarily see that there's too much difference between a League One player and, and a Championship or a Premier League, because we're still talking about a person's life here. The only difference will be their pay packet, if we're brutally honest. So I actually think that, I remember coming down here on a Friday and we'd done a session and I ended up joining in the session a little bit, which was a bit stupid at my age with young lads. And I remember coming up from it afterwards and feeling really, really tired. And I probably think I'd already had maybe the symptoms in me, but I think the fatigue allowed it to grab hold of me. So I would just say to anyone, from the start, if I can remember anything, 
when you're working, when I first came into the job here, probably it was something like 16, 18 hours a day out of 24, and it was full on. We were bottom of the league, and there was so much work that needed to be done, not just on the training ground, but you know, when you wake up in the middle of the night, you think, we've got to remember that tomorrow because it's important. So I used to have a, a pen and paper by my bed and I'd write things down and then I'd have to try and get up in the morning and decipher my writing and try and work out what I'd written in the night. Um, but I think it was a point of fatigue. And I think that's key for anybody out there at the moment that is really throwing their all into the job, whatever job they're doing. I don't necessarily, it doesn't have to be a football manager. Just make sure that once you throw yourself into that working environment, that you get them moments at home for yourself to regenerate, to recuperate, um, and strangely enough, to get a good night's sleep. I think that is absolutely vital, getting the hours that you require. A lot of us will read a lot of things these days about sleep and how important it is. And when you're young, you can pass it off and get up and get away with a few hours sleep and get on with it the next day. But I think sleep was really important. And I didn't say, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't say that I slept very well in that first month. And I definitely think it was the fatigue that allowed COVID to, to get me because I don't believe it would have got me otherwise. So I think that's really important for someone to, or for, for anyone out there, to remember that moment. And if you're working too hard, just wind your neck in a little bit and have a little bit of rest. Tell me the story when you found out you had COVID. Was it a return test or did, was it symptoms? What happened there? I, um, I remember going back to the hotel on the Friday night when I felt a bit tired after training. And I remember having dinner early and then I got in a hot bath and then I got into bed and it must have been about nine o'clock at night. And I know I didn't feel right, but I didn't quite know what was wrong with me at the time. Didn't anticipate having COVID or anything. And I remember waking up about three o'clock in the morning and the bed sheets were absolutely drenched. And then I thought something's not quite right with me. So obviously new sheets on the bed, woke up in the morning. I felt really, really poorly, but I didn't quite know what was wrong with me. I suppose I had a bit of a, a funny taste, but not necessarily lost my taste. I did have a headache, um, funny enough through all of it, I didn't feel sick. Uh, and then I remember going in and I had a lateral flow test and that was positive then. So that was time for me then, I had to isolate in the hotel by myself really and have sort of food dropped at the door. And um, I had to isolate for 10 days in the hotel didn't go out of the room, in fact didn't go out of bed, you know, the first, for those 10 days, um, people say four and five, day four and five was, is worse, I think it might be if you're going to come out the other end very quickly, for me I ended up being in there 10 days, all I'd done was wake up in the morning, um, I had a coffee left outside my door for breakfast, didn't eat, I ate a bowl of fruit at lunchtime, um, probably throughout the day got up to use the toilet once and then I went straight back to bed. So I was continually in bed for that 10 days. I lost about a stone and a half, felt really poorly and, um, and I wasn't getting any better. So I remember then going home to Bristol and um, I remember being there for three or four days, the coffin, coughing was getting worse um, to a point where you know we've all had a cough <clears throat> and I'm about to cough now I've said about something about coughing that <clears throat> but um, the coughing got so bad that you think you're gonna pass out and I remember I remember at the time speaking to um, the old club doctor at Bristol City called Jonathan Williams, who was a who was a great guy, and he said to me, "You need have you got a Sats machine at home that do, does your blood oxygen and all of that?" Um, and we ended up getting one of them, and then my Sats were dropping dangerously. So we all live off about twenty percent oxygen. It's what we've got in this room. It's what we've got outside. We all need that twenty percent. 
anyway, to cut a long story short, he he ended up phoning me the following day, and my stats had dropped a lot again. No energy, coughing, couldn't eat. Um, and then I I got taken in by ambulance. I couldn't have got myself in there really. I went into the BRI then, and. Um, I remember going in there and then they put you in a holding bay for a little while so you're just in, you, you get to the hospital, you have to stay in the ambulance until there's space in a holding bay. So you just sit in the ambulance and they, they've they now put oxygen on you because you're struggling to breathe. And um, I, um, I then eventually got into a holding room where they, you know, it was the start of many, many blood tests, needles, injections, you know, they were nigh on every day then. Um, but I remember going in there and I needed, I needed 91% oxygen, which was, I knew I was bad, but I didn't quite realise I was that bad. And that was where it all started really, when I got into that holding room, and I was in that holding room for probably, I don't know, maybe a good 12 to 14 hours before before they can actually find you a room on a COVID ward, which ended up being the A800, the A800 ward in the in the Bristol Royal Infirmary. So um, that that was the start of it before it all really started, if that makes sense. Just one thing I want to touch on before we talk about the hospital admission and things like that, because I know this would mean a lot to you, being away from your staff and your players. Yeah. How was that for you? I'm sure that was a, a terrible experience, really, at the start of, of a really bad ordeal. Well, the the whole thing, the whole thing is, um, it's an incredibly bad experience. The whole thing, and yet, it's funny because, hopefully, as I've started to get better or feel stronger, um, I actually think that it could be, maybe one of the best experiences of my life. And the reason I say that is with this, and that's the reason for doing this, m maybe if I share and bear my soul, it might help those people out there that haven't had their injections yet, or they're not convinced on it, or those people that have suffered and they're on the road to coming back that is very much like this. So that's the reason for wanting to do this. Some of it will be quite emotional for me. You'll just have to bear with me on that. Um, um, I forgot the question now, what you said. Being away from the players and, and yeah, I mean, with your team. You know, it, it's not just being away from the players and the team, it's being away from your family. Once you finally get into a room, because you can't, you can't see them, they can't visit you. Um, so, you know, as... As the other interview I did earlier, um, being away from um, Aaron, the rest of the staff, Davey, who I had first of all working with me just before Aaron come in, and the other lads, and the players. As I said before, you know, I, I felt as though I left them. Um, but thankfully, obviously in the first month, they took to me enough to carry on doing the work that we'd started. Some of it started to wane at the end. We know that. Um, but I think that, you know, going back to what I said about Aaron, what I said about Dave, they did an incredible job, incredible job for me. And I, you know, I'll be forever grateful to to the staff and to the players, really. Um, you know, just watching them on, a, on an iPad, um, or if the if the Wi-Fi had gone, trying to watch a game on your phone, very very difficult. Gaffer, you've touched on going to the hospital, the early stages of going in to the hospital. Was there a moment for you where you thought, "I'm in trouble here. This this is really serious." Yeah, probably when I woke up in that Shrewsbury hotel and the bed was soaked, I could nearly swim in it. So I thought, I thought some of them was not quite right with me, but obviously when I got to the hospital and then needed, you know, 91% oxygen, then I knew I was struggling a bit. But I knew before I'd got there that I wasn't right. The coughing was incredible. I can't, honestly, I can't explain how bad that was. Um, 
so the coffin, once the coffin had got, even when I was at home, I knew the coffin was, you almost got to choking effect with it. Um, so I knew that when I was struggling. When I got to the hospital, and I, I knew I knew that I was bad anyway. I think then it, it only got, it went from bad to worse, if you know what I mean, when I was in the hospital. I think, um, but when you get up in a ward, you're in a, you're in your ward then, you're in your room and you, you're not allowed to leave the room because it's a COVID ward. So you never go, you can't get out and walk up and down the corridor or anything like that, even if you put a mask on. And by the time we got there then, anyway, I'd lost a stone and a half, so I'm not sure I would have been strong enough anyway. And then your medications start coming in, so everything then is done intravenously, it's done quick. I needed, um, I needed, I don't know, probably three weeks of fluids just hydrating me. I was so dehydrated. Um, and then there were steroids and everything else that that you have to take. And so I think probably, I knew I was poorly before I even got to the hospital because I don't go to the doctors, let alone go to the hospital. I think the last time I visited my doctor probably would have been something like 30 years ago. So I don't, I don't, I'm not one that goes to the doctor. I, I don't take paracetamol necessarily when I've got a headache. Having said that, I take it now because I've been educated. Um, so I, I knew I was poorly. I think, I think really when you don't get well after being in hospital, so I'd had, I'd had uh, numerous blood tests every day. So there was always, always blood being taken from me. I didn't, I didn't realize um, you could take so much from someone. I thought I'd have been on empty. There was so much blood every day. My arms were, you know, they were the bruises that, that I had from that was, it was incredible really. I mean, you know, we're only talking about bruises, but you know, once you keep taking it from them veins, it, it really gets sore when they keep taking them. So, um, I think so much blood being taken, it's not the moment of the needle going in, it's just continuous all the time. So there would be, um, in the end, my veins, in the end, they, they, we got to a point where they couldn't find any more veins. So I had to have, um, I had to have what's called a pick line, um, P-I-C-C line, pick line, put in. And that was more where they could, so it's almost it was almost like a mini operation that I had in my ho in my hospital room, um, and there was about four people, big ultrasound scan, and then what they had to do was nick a little hole underneath my bicep, and they had to put through, um, they had to thread through um, a tube that came all the way through, that came right round my chest and straight down to my heart, and this is the worst worst part of it really that people people perhaps won't know um, as, as they were coming through with this to go into my heart my lung got punctured so I ended up with a punctured lung so when you're then on oxygen and you're taking oxygen down it's almost like you're trying to blow up a balloon but it's got a pinprick in the neck of the balloon so every time you're blowing it up it's coming out so you're never quite getting the oxygen to your lungs that you need because there's a hole in the lung but then the air has to go somewhere in your body but when it comes out of your lungs normally when we breathe air out we breathe or the proper way to breathe is in through your nose and out through your mouth what it does is that escapes then into your skin so i then end up with emphysema so not only have I got COVID, I've got COVID, a punctured lung, and emphysema. So in the meantime, I've probably lost a stone and a half in weight. You know, I've got a neck that is huge, my neck, because it's, it's coming out of my lungs and it's all into my neck. So I've got a neck that is, you know, I don't know, like Mike Tyson in his A-Day. It's got... You know, I had a huge, strong neck, didn't he? And I had, um, and I, you know, I had no muscles. My legs had gone, my arms had gone. So, you know, that was very, very difficult as well. 
Um, so I think not only having the COVID, I kept saying for a few days, you know, that after I'd had the pit line in, that something was not quite right with me. Anyway, I remember waking up four or five days later in the middle of the night. And whenever you have got this, they tell, tell you to talk about chest pains. I suppose that's because they want to find out whether you're you can have a heart attack or you've had one, because sometimes we can have one we don't necessarily know we have. And I remember waking up one night and it was almost like um, I was really tight across my chest, really tight. And the following day, so straight away that night, about 4 a.m., I had a, I think it was an ECG. Um, so they did all that. Then I had somebody come down from intensive care um, where I'd where I'd been before, which I'll talk about. Um, they were incredible. The people in intensive care, absolutely incredible. Um, so I think that yeah. I mean, I think from from that moment, I think they had every test to go in. Then everything, scans, X rays echocardiograms, everything. It was almost like it was a fairground and I had a ride on every one of those machines the following day. Um, and at the time they hadn't known that my lung had been punctured and that's why I wasn't really getting better. When I was in intensive care, um, I mean, they were the people in there. The, the care that you get off of people there is is just incredible, really. Um, and the oxygen you have, and when you've got to have, you know, masks on you and all of that business, you do think at one point, my God, you know, am I am I going to get out of here? But you have to try and get that out of your your thoughts very quickly. You know, I've never I've never not fought for anything in my life, so I thought. And I've fought for a lot of people in my life. So I thought, well, I'm sure I can find the strength to fight for my life then. Um, you know, I have I have an incredible family and I, I'm not prepared to leave them yet. Um, so that was a tough time because then, you know, you haven't even got FaceTime or anything like that, any phone calls my phone was just racking up with messages i just didn't feel well enough or have the energy enough to start plowing through anything um the the only the time then when i was when i was in intensive care was i think the 16th of of january and while you're in while you're in intensive care to get these the steroids that you know what they do is they m my face is puffy compared to what it would be normally um, I have fat around my middle that I wouldn't say I normally have that's part of the steroids where you put weight on which I would say that I don't like but thankfully um, I have I have an incredible specialist in Katrina Curtis who who, who I love to death um, without her I might not have been here and she um, she sort of took over my case and uh, Without her, I saw her last week before I come back to training um, to see the boys and where I'd been and what I'd been doing in the gym. I know I keep bopping backwards and forwards here, but there's a there's a storyline to this really. And she um and she was great with me, you know. When, like I said, when I was in intensive care, I had to have what's called a tocilizumab injection. And if anyone tries to repeat that, you'll never get it right the first time you say it. The amount of times I've had to practice, not just for this, but so I could actually tell people about it. it. There was a story about it not long ago in the Times, and it was about this little bottle um, called tocilizumab. And um, what that actually does when you have that, it sort of um, lowers your immune system because the steroids need to get there to be able to do the work on your lungs. So it sort of lowers them defences that once they load you with the steroids the steroids can fight the covid but then the tocilizumab it'll be in you for three months so 
I was not allowed, I had to be very, very careful for three months because I would have been vulnerable to anything which readmission back into hospital proved, if, if you know what I mean. So I had that, but you need to have it. Um, and that was obviously good for the steroids to work, but tricky for me down the line. Even though I could have my vaccine, I couldn't have my vaccine for three months anyway. So I had to wait for three months for that one because of the tocilizumab getting out of my system for 90 days. So it was quite difficult trying to balance it all really. Um, so yeah, once, once then I come back out of intensive care, I went back downstairs. I was still quite poorly when I was in, the, uh, in my room. And I remember the head registrar coming down one day from, from intensive care and I, I really wasn't getting any better, but I didn't think I needed the intensive care treatment again. And he come down and he, he sat on the end of my bed and I, he said to me, how do you feel? And I said, yeah, I don't feel great. So he said to me, do you, um, where would you say you feel? So I said to him, well, a bit like Shrewsbury really in the relegation zone. So he said to me, mm. he said, I think you're a little bit worse off than Shrewsbury in the relegation zone. He said, I think you're in a relegation zone minus about six points, he said. So I thought, I said to him, well, that's handy to know. Thanks for that, for cheering me up. He did say to me that he thought he thought I should go back up into intensive care. I convinced him not. I thought that there were... I knew I was poorly, but I'd already been in intensive care. And I didn't think that what I was going to have done in intensive care, even as brilliant as they were, I needed it at that moment. Um, because I've, I said to him, I'm sure somebody needs that bed more than I do. And he said to me, well, maybe, maybe not. But I convinced him in the end that I didn't need it. And I felt I felt that bed should go to somebody else because I knew I, need, I didn't need to go back there. I think normally in your life, if you've been a sportsman, you probably do know your body a little bit. So um, I convinced him not. I didn't need to go back up there. In the meantime then, it was trying to get over the punctured lung, the emphysema, the emphysema, the punctured lung sounds worse than the emphysema, but the emphysema was worse because it's like a, it's like a choking effect, where your windpipe ends up narrowing, so then food is harder, talking's harder. Um, so any sort of communication, you know, it was it was difficult really. Gaffer, at one point you did leave the hospital. I'm sure you were hoping you were going to get better, and that was the end of your ordeal, but. After a month in the hospital, you ended up getting called back in with COVID pneumonia. Talk me through that whole scenario. Well, it's funny because the whole lot, I totaled six, something like 69 days out of 80 in bed, the whole bit, from Shrewsbury to going home, to then another 34 days um, in the hospital before I could leave and go home. And it's funny because I had, a, I had, um, I had an exercise routine I was doing step ups on window sills and press ups on my bed. Um, I had an exercise bike in my room that I asked for. Uh, I had some of the bands that the lads use to strengthen their legs, and I had everything up in my room to try and get out. And I remember, I remember Katrina Curtis saying to me, probably a week before I went out, my specialist, she said to me, I don't know whether it's your your strength that is getting you out or whether you're well enough to try and get out. She said, I can't quite determine that at the moment. So I ended up having another week stay in there. This is before I come home. And uh, in the end, I think I don't, you know, all with my oxygen on, but I had it. I had wires going all the way across the room. There was extension leads on, on bloods, on drips, everything I was on. There was extension leads on it, so as I could get to do these step ups on a windowsill. Because it's funny because actually, 
sitting down and getting up is one of the most difficult things that I've found. Um, why that is, I don't know. It's funny because I said to her that the hardest thing I'm finding to do are squats. You know, and I don't mind saying this. Early on when I was poorly, the hardest thing was getting out of bed and uh, sitting on a commode to go to the toilet. Because I was plugged in, my, my heart rate and everything, my sats would go through the roof and the machines would be bleeping and everybody then, you know, you sat on a commode, there's no privacy there. Um, and everybody's coming in through the door, drawing the curtains, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. In fact, I'm better now than I was a couple of minutes ago before I sat on this commode. <laughs> so, um, as regards all of that, and the nurses were, were absolutely brilliant. So in the end, I sort of fought my way out, really, that's how I felt. You know, I'd got down to doing so many press-ups on my bed. I showed her the routine that I'd done. I'd wrote my routine down every day, and where my heart rate was at the start of it, where it was at the finish of that exercise, where my blood sats were, where they were at the end of it. I needed to try and give her all of those to show her where I was. So, um, you know, when I was when I was doing that, um, I managed to get myself home, and it was it was amazing, really, just coming out of that room and going home, um, just looking out. You know, out of your own front room onto the water and all of that it was it was just fantastic for me. You know, some of the things that you just don't appreciate um, that you take for granted or you never take any notice of, just flowers on the side and things like that. You know, I remember walking through the door and there was some some beautiful yellow tulips on the side, and it would they would I don't know why I noticed them, but it was like the first thing I noticed. They say yellow is a colour that catches your eye first anyway whether it was that or not I don't know but just appreciating appreciating those small things and finer things in life that normally I I wouldn't take any notice of them at all so going home I, I just felt I, for about six days I just couldn't stop smiling don't matter what anybody had said to me I, I could never be offended it was just brilliant to be out probably to be alive um probably that probably to be alive I think because it was a tough time and I think after about six days I started dipping a little bit but when you're in there you're in so before I come out you know I was on steroids from the time I went in there so when you're on steroids for a long period of time what had happened during the first period of being in hospital before we before I do get out was my steroids would go up and then they would try and wean me off them and then once I got weaned off of them whether it was anything to do with the lung or whatever I'd never quite I used to dip so being weaned off of the steroids is quite an important thing really it, I'm, I'm still on them now but a, a lot lower dose and I dropped them just before I come back to training and I'm due to drop them again next week so when you drop them there's always them couple of four or five days afterwards where you dip a little bit, um, and before I'd come out, I had to have, I mean they say the recommended dose of steroids that are not dangerous to you, are something like five to seven milligrams. And I had to have three days hit intravenously, a thousand milligrams. So I had to have 3,000 in three days. But what actually is, because what actually happens in the first 24 hours, because you have them at 10 o'clock, I think it was uh, the Wednesday, the Tuesday it was, the Tuesday, because we had a game that night. So I had to have the 1,000 milligrams that day that went into me in 35 minutes. And then when you go to 10 o'clock the following day, it's almost like you've had 2,000 in 24, 25 hours. So that was the, that was quite a big hit, and when I had the third hit, I think that was almost at a point where. I. You don't realise at the time. Perhaps how poorly you are. And she only referenced it to me, 
probably when would I see it? Probably six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago, when I said to her, you know, I need to I need to get better quicker. And she said to me, I don't think you quite realise, Steve, how bad you were. You know, you were close to dying in here, which I wouldn't I wouldn't want to shout about, but I, I do think it's important people know this. Not not necessarily about me, just where it can get you. Um, and I'm probably still saying that because I'm saying that to all those people out there that are not quite sure about having the vaccines. You know, you will be fine if you have this vaccine. You will be fine. So I, I just need them to know that, you know, I would like to say that I was young enough, fit enough, healthy, strong enough. And she said to me, I don't think you quite realise where you were. And normally if you're on, if you're on 60 or 70 milligrams, that, that is an incredible amount of steroids to be on. To have those three um, kilo hits in three days, I remember her saying to me, she said to me that you're going to feel quite wired um, when you have these. I said, well, that's Andy, we've got a game tonight, so I'll be alright for the game tonight. So I remember having them, and I remember being quite wired in the game. And then and then I thought to myself, I'm going to be like this for three days. And um, it's funny, but on the Wednesday, I felt incredibly flat. In incredible. Um, and I, I felt really poorly on that Wednesday. And then when I had them again on the Thursday, I would say I didn't feel the best on the Thursday. And through that first period, even though we've bopped backwards and forwards here of coming out of hospital or not, on that Thursday and Friday, I didn't do any exercise at all. I had no motivation whatsoever. And I think that was the point in and around that time when she might have been referencing how, how close maybe I could have been. Um, but you know, thankfully and thanks to her, that tended to work and it tended to, on the x-rays then, showing up the scarring that had been on my lungs from the COVID was clearing. Um, she actually thought I might keep that scarring for life. I said to her at the time, no chance, that won't happen. And, uh, and she said to me, how are you gonna do that? I said, I'm gonna exercise them to death. I'm going to exercise them so as they do come back and work for me. You know, they've been very lucky. They nev they've never had a puff of cigarette smoke going them all their life. So, you know, I've looked after them for a long time. It's time for them to look after me. So we had a bit of a giggle about that. Um, um, and then when I came out, the, on the only thing when I came out the first time was I didn't have any antibiotics. So when I had that tocilizumab injection and then I came out, I didn't have antibiotics when I came out. Um, and that led to COVID pneumonia. So then I got readmitted and then went straight back in the hospital. The steroids went up another couple of notches again after be dropping them, going back up. So that's put my steroids back up, then put me on antibiotics. Um, and I still been on the same antibiotics up to a week ago. And now I'm on antibiotic that's got an anti-inflammatory in it that I only have to take three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, when I went back in the second time, um, it was back on the oxygen again, after not having the oxygen for 11 days, which was, which was, which was brilliant. Um, so, I think, I think that, that going back in was probably the right thing. I needed to do that. Um, she felt as though it was right. So I had to go through uh, that whole point of the mental side of it again, going back in and being in a room again and, you know, seeing some of the, the nurses and the doctors that have worked so hard for you to leave, um, see you get readmitted. It was, it was 32 rooms on the wall. It was shaped like a horseshoe. And it was amazing, really. You know, some of the nurses are absolutely incredible. You know, you get a nurse or two that will be designated to looking after you throughout the day. 
Um, but then they all used to come down and knock on the door and wave through the window because obviously they can't come in because they're dealing with other COVID patients. Um, but incredibly emotional time. It, it, it's amazing up there because even the, I think even the patients that are well enough or savvy enough um, to um, know what's going on. We talk about how tough this is when you get this. It's even tougher when you're in the hospital and you see people come past your room and they're sat up and then maybe a couple of days later they're going out and they're not going home. I think that was incredibly tough because it's someone's mother, father, grandparents um, and it's, it's very close to you because you know that, that could be you. Um, and there always used to be a somber mood and that happened. The nurses would come in and you would say to them, are you okay? It was quite good because some of the nurses, once they got to know me a little bit, they would, um, they'd come in my room for a pep talk, which was quite nice. They used to openly say it, they'd come in, sit down in the room and, uh, used to try and cheer them up and say what a great job they've been doing and um, I think until you see that that is really sad um, so yeah I think um, I think those times were very emotional when you're seeing people go in and out you know I remember there was a lady next door to me once, you know, just to try and lighten the mood once. She was, she needed 24 hour watch, she'd come in. And she'd had, uh, she'd obviously picked up COVID, but she had dementia. And um, you're not meant to go out your doors. But obviously she was up and about. And um, it hadn't been very long when she was put in a room next door to me. And I remember her coming in coming into my room one day and um, she knocked on the door and I thought, I didn't know she was she was a patient, she was just walking around, she had no oxygen on her. And she um, she knocked on my door and walked in. And I said, oh, hello, how are you? I said, I'm very good, thank you, how are you? She said, uh, have you seen my dog? I said, no, I haven't seen it today. Because I thought then obviously something had gone wrong and. Um, and all of a sudden a nurse came in and took her back out and put her back in, looked after her and come back into my room and apologised and all that business. And I just said to her, you know, have you found her dog? She needs her dog. So she, I think from what I could gather, she was at home by herself and she'd had her, she's had her dog and that was all she had, I think, by the sound of it at home. But bless her, you know, all of those things are, it's incredible really. You have to, you have to be there to see it, to know anything about what it's like. It is, um, I don't, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I normally cry or anything like that, but I don't think I've ever cried so much in probably about four or five months as I've done in the last four or five months. When I think back to it, other than that, and you'll see that in the next few weeks, I'm fine. But when you tap back on it, I think... I think it's. Um, I think it will be one of the best experiences of my life. I don't quite know why I'm saying that at the moment. I just feel that, um, and I would never want anyone to see me close to tears, emotional, because once this goes out, it goes everywhere. But I actually feel compelled that I need to do this, and need to do that for 
the people out there, like I've said before, that are not sure about having their vaccine, and for those people that are suffering to think that, because when you're suffering, you're there by yourself suffering. You haven't got anybody else with you. It doesn't matter what family you've got. You can have 10 brothers and sisters, but they can't come to see you. So it's all about you and what you do and how you fight it and how you st sort of st try and stay focused to get better. Um, so then when I went back in, you know, and coming back out again was, I think when I was coming back out the second time, the first time was full of jubilation. The second time I was a little bit more sceptical and, and I was worried. Where was I going to be with the doses of steroids? Where was I going to be when I ended up dropping my dose that I'm, I'm working really hard to get rid of them and I'm, I'm doing well on them now, touch wood. Um, but once I can get rid of them and then try and get some sort of normality back in my body, um, in terms of getting rid of the water that swells in and around your face. I always look like I've got, you know, my eyes are sunk, whereas my eyes haven't moved, it's just my cheeks are puffier, so I see them. I see them a lot more often. Um, and just getting rid of that, that extra bit of excess weight that you carry that makes you makes you tired, you know. So for those people that are looking at this, if you if you're on steroids, you know, I mean, I've been on them for months now, you know, and I wouldn't take two paracetamol, let alone take your four paracetamol or six or anything like that, you know. They they will do the job for you, you know. If anyone's on them and they're looking at this, they will do the job for you. Um, see it through. I ignore ignore where you've put on a little bit of weight because it is starting to go. I mean, my, my face, I can feel it in my face um, now where I do feel better than I felt. And that's because my I'm down to 10 milligrams now, which is like, you know, this is massive for me to be knocking these steroids down, to, to get rid of it, to try and get some normality and live without being on them, you know. But but try, try to, for those people that are on it that will see this or wherever it goes around the country or whatever, keep taking them. They will do you good in the end. Keep seeing the daylight. Don't get too down about it. When you've got an opportunity to exercise, um, do the exercise. The exercise is important. Work really hard on your exercise within your capabilities, obviously, but work really hard. But then once you've done that, you've then got to have a day off. You've got to have a break. Don't get yourself, and this goes back to, I've worked this out from, from where I had it right at the beginning, when we finished, when we started this interview, about I felt as I caught it on fatigue. So when you're getting better, don't work yourself to fatigue in the gym. So I go so far, and then I stop. But then I need rest and my body to recuperate before I can go again in the gym. And the better I've got, you know, from from the beginning is incredible. I couldn't do five minutes on a watt bike when I first went back down the gym. I started um, right at the back end of last season, and I had to fight because I had to be here on first of July. I had to be here. I had to be here for the players. I had to be here for the football club. Um, so I'm still chasing my tail a bit with it. But I couldn't do five minutes on a watt bike. I couldn't do anything. I could hardly do any weights. I was as weak as a kitten. Um, but now I do 30 minutes on a watt bike and I do an hour of work in the gym on all the weights. So um, <laughs> you might see me muscles when I lose a bit of weight. But um, yeah, so for those people with that, stick with it. Stay determined, stay focused. You, you, will, you will get better. And this is from someone who's not better yet, but you will get better. You will get better. It's just, it is time. One thing, it's funny, uh, that used to really, really annoy me was when I, say I bumped into you today and it's Tuesday or whatever and you said to me, how do you feel? And I said, yeah, not great. And then I bump into you tomorrow and you say exactly the same, how do you feel? Because you don't get better from Tuesday to Wednesday. You know, you might find there's an improvement from Tuesday to Tuesday, you know, and so on and so forth like that. It's more weekly and monthly with, I mean, they call it long COVID because there's nothing else they can call it, you know, but probably that's where I am. I don't. I don't know if that's where I am, but that's probably where I am with it. Um, 
but you can get better with this. But you've got to stay strong. You've got to you've got to try and get physically strong, um, but you've got to stay mentally strong. You've got to be mentally strong to turn that mental side into the physical bits that you can do. Um, and I just think it's going to be one of them long periods that I'm going to have to accept this for. You know, one flight of stairs is fine, but the second one, by the time I get to the top, I will be breathing heavily again. Or, you know, we've sat doing doing this for a fair bit today. The, the talking um, is tiring. It's tiring. The segment of you leaving hospital for the final time is really important, and I think we should should finish on that but what I want to talk about first is we, we seem to be forgetting you were working still in hospital working at tactics at 4am in the morning what what was that experience like and how did you muster up the strength to, to be doing tactics at 3, 4 in the morning and well it's funny early on we tapped on about sleep didn't we well I don't, I don't know whether it's a steroid or what it is but sleep deprivation is is something in, in normal times it it would it would wear you down in the end. In the hospital, for whatever reason, um, I may start feeling tired about ten or eleven o'clock at night, and I'd go to sleep, and I'd go out like a light, and I probably in the hospital didn't sleep any more than three or four, three and a half to four hours a night, and it wasn't like I slept through the day either, because the steroids just kept boosting me and boosting me all the time so I would wake up at probably one or two o'clock in the morning and then I'd ring for a cup of tea so I'd have a cup of tea and then I'd be sat I'd be wide awake wide awake and um, that's when I used to do the planning and the preparation for Aaron when I when I could um, so he, he would probably wake up this is why I say you know he he deserves I don't know, so much credit. I just couldn't give him enough, you know. If there's a wheelbarrow full of credit, one wheelbarrow wouldn't be enough. Um, I, I mean, I love him to death. And um, every every day he would wake up to... The worst part about it was I only had a pad. I didn't have any team sheets. So on everything I was writing or planning... Um, I had to draw a pitch as well. That used to be one of the, annoying, the most annoying things. I had to draw the pitch before I could start. So I draw the pitch, and then there would be. Um, I had to get a couple of coloured pens. So you know the ones that had like a black and a blue and a red. You know the ones at the top that the nurses actually use. But it was really handy because then I could always put that as start point, reference point. And you know he he probably wake up to this newspaper, uh, this piece of paper in the morning, and it would look like. It looked like the red arrows had just flown over pages. With it. But then I'd have to write it, what I meant by this. And then on his way in in the morning, um, I would call him or he would call me. And I would talk him through it in his tripping in the morning. Um, and then when he went in and he shared that with Dave and the rest of the staff, probably then he would phone me just before they went out to training. Um, or I'd get a text message off him with a thumbs up saying all negative, which meant the lads were all, were all fine. I wanted to know about that every time they were tested. Um, but but I think what he had to do, he just went through everything, Aaron, really. He woke up to that. I just felt as though I needed to do that so I could watch. I, I actually think it was it helped me. So, I, you know, I was only doing what I felt I should probably do in any way. And it's only what I would have been doing if I'd have been at home or at work. So I think doing all that with him, and then, then what would happen, they would video training, and then I'd get the video in the afternoon, and then I'd go through the video in the afternoon, and then I'd ring him back then saying, you know, how well they done on this point, but I think this point could be better. And if we're doing this, why don't we try that from the other side of the pitch? Because I think we might better do that. So there would be a lot of, a lot of talking. I, I spoke to Aaron more than I spoke to anybody, more than I spoke to anybody, more than I spoke to anyone in my family. I spoke to Aaron because um, I suppose the length of the time um, we were on the phone was incredible, really. But 
um, you know, I, I'm sure that he didn't have, whilst I didn't have any home life then, he, he didn't have much either. So uh, it was always good to be able to write things down because the talking and with the mask on and all of that was always more difficult at the time. So writing, being sat up in bed um, and going through things was probably the best way that I could communicate with him. But then, you know, someone sends you a text message. You can look at it sometimes and you think, oh, don't like that. But it's not actually meant to be like it's typed. You know, whereas if someone said it to you, it comes across as something completely different. So, yeah, there was a lot of there was a lot of work done. There was a lot of pads that I used in in the hospital. Um, it was it was really good as well because when the games used to be on, the nurses used to put a note upon my room, you know, do not disturb, <laughs> which is incredible really because they could see outside of my room my screen, my sats, my heart rate, all of, you know, they did come rushing in a couple of times when a game was on, when my heart rate had gone through the roof and it was flashing red up there, you know, so they, there was a couple of moments they had panics, but, you know, they used to put everything on my room, you know, match day, leave him alone, <laughs> all of those things, so uh, they were incredible really, but needed to do that stuff with Aaron, but he did, he get he did get a lot of it, and I'm I'm pretty sure as well. You know, whilst he got some praise, he got some stern words as well. When we got beat, if you know what I mean, which isn't isn't necessarily his fault, isn't necessarily the players' fault on the day, and um, you know, but yeah, he was he was great. But I actually think that that part of it, somewhere along, gave me some focus. So I know, I know that lots of people sent messages into the club about you know working from your hospital bed I actually think that that helped me now I'm looking back on it I'm not sure it helped me at the time but I actually think that it gave me that focus it gave me that focus Gaffer how did you pick the team for a weekend um, well it, it was funny because I felt going, going into the window obviously you know that it just left Keith out there to speak to a lot of agents and do and do a lot of work and we weren't in a good position in the table so people when they're coming out on loan they don't necessarily want to come to a team that's down at the bottom because they don't want to be associated with a team that's been losing um, so to try and get players in and and um, move players on for whatever reasons you're doing it you know something needed to change because if you if you carry on doing the self same thing and expecting different results i mean it's a don't they say that's the first sign of madness so we needed to to change things here but then obviously keith keith burt was he was um he was outside by himself now i i would always work closely with him on any of them things you know in the past and when we get on great but you know whilst we get on great we've had we've had many a ding dong if you know what I mean, when we're not sure about things or whatever like that, which is a healthy one, I mean. But um, I think that I think that that left Keith out there by himself, which was difficult for him as well. You know that that January window, because you're not going to get everything perfect then. You're not you're not going to get everything perfect when you've got a summer window, let alone let alone um, um, the window in January, because that's it's an awful time to. To purchase, great time to sell, but awful time to try and purchase players, and especially if you're down at the bottom of the table. So, so that was um, that was very difficult. And then what we had to do, as because the games certainly in that last seven weeks, it was Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. I mean, it, normally when you play a Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, it's nice if you can have another week's break then, because then three three games crammed into eight days, incredibly hard, incredibly hard. Um, and I think we needed to um, we needed to recruit for the short term as well as some of the long term in that window to start the process because there wasn't enough of a process here what we had on the caliber of player that we would want to look at. So starting that process then, you know, it's probably going to take 
looking at it wholly. I'm just going to take a few windows here to to be able to sift through and get everything to a starting point, if you know what I mean. Um, so picking a team was very, very difficult. Um, very difficult because I'm not seeing them in training. So I would be advised sometimes by Dave and by Aaron and if they both felt the same because what they'd seen in training. Um, then, then we went through that a couple of times. Um, there would have been a couple of things I wasn't sure about. Um, and sometimes they come up trumps with them and sometimes they didn't. But that's part and parcel of it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, guided by those guys as well. Um, obviously, we had a disruption in the goalkeeping situation last year, which wasn't helpful. wasn't helpful for me either at the, at the point of time that that came about. I wasn't healthy enough either then. So it was difficult to pick a team because you can't you can't see I mean sometimes when you see in training anyway, you know, it's sometimes I'd have to use I'd have to use my phone because the, the Wi Fi'd be down in, in a hospital and that, that was a that was a nightmare. I remember starting one game and um I remember starting it and uh it, it, it just went blank for 11 minutes. I lost the game for 11 minutes. So I'm on the phone to Aaron, just saying to me, giving me a running commentary, where's the ball? Where's the ball? You know, as long as it was in there, half, I wasn't so worried at the time. But that was, uh, I remember that one, I couldn't get something for 11 minutes. I was getting, then my heart rate was going up on this machine. and um, That wasn't the best of times, I remember that. Keith's okay, definitely got an interesting story to tell and we'll speak to him at some point. Um, managing the players that he's recruited that you'd, some of them maybe never met. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, really strange. Really strange. When I come back into the to the dressing room at the end of the season, uh, I really wanted to try and get back, even though I wasn't ready. I really, really wanted to get back because I felt as though we were coming to a point in the season where um, not so much about meeting the new boys, but more about I just needed to make a few decisions on some of the older boys, so I needed to see them up close and personal, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I think it was really about getting back and seeing them rather than meeting the new boys. But it was nice to meet the new boys because I'd only, you know, chatted out to them from a speaker, so they never quite. You know, they could probably think, who is this guy? You know, might know who I was, but you know, when you haven't met anybody, it's it's completely different. Which is why I said on the on the first video that I don't I, I don't think that those boys should ever ever be forgotten. And you know, if we play against any of them this year and they come back, you know, they'll be welcomed back with open arms. And um, yeah, like I said, never never forget that group of lads I'll never forget them for what they've done for me when I wasn't here just solely that even if they made a mistake just solely what they did throughout the rest of the games and and, and got us to safety in the end when Aaron Wilbraham sent you a whatsapp message everyone in there get well soon get for t-shirts what did that mean to you oh, there'd been a few more tears as well that day I've got it now I've got it I've got a picture of it it's on my uh, it's on my desk in my office yeah, it takes pride to place that. Um, just, you know, incredible, really. Everybody at the football club, I just can't, I can't thank them enough for it. You know, if, if you used to say to me, do you think you need love? I'd have gone, no, I'll probably be all right, take it or leave it. But, you know, it's at a time where I probably, I did need it. I did need it. And then by getting it, it, it makes you fight even more for them um, so I had a reason to fight we were just talking about being down the gym and on that what bike you know to get to 30 minutes on the what bike I was doing an hour to get to 30 minutes on the what bike to go from five minutes when I first got on the when I first got on there for five minutes I used to get these stabbing pains in my back I used to get these stabbing pains it was like the worst stitch 
you could possibly ever, ever get. I mean, a stitch is bad enough, and if you hold it for a little while, it'll go. This stabbing pain used to go on for minutes. It was like every pedal, every pedal I had to grind through that pain to try and get rid of it. And I thought, you know, and then I'm ch checking my blood sats on my watch to make sure I'm, I'm all right, you know, and check my heart rate and all of that business. But all of those things that people did for me while I was away and how supportive they were, um, that gave me something to fight for. And the supporters, you know, I'd only managed them for a month. I'd only been here, you know, and they were just incredible, our supporters. I'll never, I'll never forget them for that, you know. I know, I know that was the same for clubs up and down the country. You know, I'd had goodwill messages from teams I managed, teams I played for, and just, you know, it, it was just overwhelming. I know that word gets used a lot, but it really, really was. Um, it was just so special. Everybody around the country, everybody from, even some people over the years, you know, ended up, I don't know, in this game, what you can do, if you can have ups and downs and fallouts and whatever like that. And some of the people that have texted me that, you know, I haven't spoken to for a long, long time, um, text you and you just think, you know, that was really nice. Did it mean a lot to you being able to deliver a team talk to the lads despite being away in hospital? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, I think, I don't know what it was like for them. And I used to speak to Aaron about it afterwards because it felt really strange for me. For them, because there's all of them, there's not so much of a spotlight on them when it's all happening. For me, speaking into my phone and then it going on loudspeaker and then me saying to somebody, I don't know, did you hear that? Sometimes they might be further away in the dressing room and they don't always shout. So then I have to say next time, so-and-so, did you hear that? So then they have to shout. Um, so for them, I would imagine it was uh, really strange. There was always always noises or always machines going on um, in my room. So I was very conscious, were they, would they always hear the bleeping that's going on in my room? You know, who do they think they're listening to? Um, so I was always very conscious of that, but I just felt as I needed to, it was the only way I could help. Sometimes the games would knock me back. The following day I would be, I would definitely hit a dip. Even when I was getting better, I would definitely dip after a game. Emotionally that used to take so much out of me. But then when we won, it was, it was just like the best feeling ever, you know, that night when the when the nurses used to come back in my room and take the signs off of the doors outside that they'd stuck on and said, uh, are we all right to come in? And I said, you certainly can. So they'd gone, oh, well, we won today then. And uh, just for them moments, they'd become Shrewsbury Town fans, if you know what I mean. Um, and other times I would say to them, no, we got beat, but we didn't we didn't deserve to get beat. I say to the players, you know, that trying to win, winning isn't everything, but trying to win is. Because sometimes, you know, the luck will run out on you one day. Um, winners, winners never lose, just the time runs out one day. And, uh, you know, they tried their very best, let's say. Final question on this segment. What an education for Aaron in his first season in coaching, that, that must have been brilliant for him and that must make you feel good being able to thrust him into the deep end kind of thing. Well I had no choice thrusting him in the deep end and in the end he had no choice. Um, what I think it will do is it will give him, we've only been back a week and he's better now than he was in the first week I brought him in or the first month he was here with me. He's better now. He's better at his job. Which he would have got better at his job anyway, but he's got better at his job quicker. So some of the responsibilities, um, 
he will take them on now. And sometimes some of those issues or potential problems won't get to me because he'll sort them out before they need to come to me now. And the good side of that really is the players will listen to him more because he has been temporary gaffer for a while, if you know what I mean. So, um, But no, I, I just think it will help him. It wasn't ideal, but it wasn't ideal for anyone, I can assure you. you know, the last thing... <clears throat> the last thing I would have wanted to be was be away, um, but yeah, he. I thought he was he was immaculate, brilliant. I love him to death anyway. The fact that he went and done the job he done makes me even more proud of him. And the other guys, by the way, as well. I know I mentioned Aaron, but Aaron did get the brunt of everything. You know, he got the brunt of my moods. He got the brunt of me being not well, where the others didn't. If you know what I mean. Davy Longwell, a couple of times I've spoken to, um, and that's because I wanted to just give him a personal call based on um, him not being left out, um, just to reassure him how important he was in it as well. But I couldn't say it to two of them. And also, we would have been wasting time doing it on a conference call every morning. So I would do it on the time that Aaron could be travelling in but I'd already written out the play, the training plan for the day, the team for the weekend, what we're going to do Monday, what we're going to do Tuesday, what we're going to do on Thursday and Friday. So, One incredible surprise that we all had the pleasure of having towards the back end of last season was your, your first time back in Shrewsbury, back in Montgomery Waters Meadow. Mm -hmm. How special was it for you seeing the lads? It was special for me. I don't know how much of a pleasure it was for all you guys, but it was special for me coming back and... Um, I really wanted to see him again, and uh, do I think I was ready for it? No, um, I definitely wasn't because once the game started, and then you know, even though I was sat in the stand, it, trying to make it a bit more vocal, that that really did take it out of me. The back end of last year, I shouldn't have done it, but I'm glad I've done it. Um, I think the travelling as well on the day of the game because I've obviously not staying anywhere. So travelling up, two and a half hours, n before the game, the 90 minutes, after the game, two and a half hours home, that did knock me for six. It would knock you for six if you were healthy, let alone if you're on the back end of coming out of where, um, there's a shot, my phone going off. Um, um, I think coming back and seeing the players for the first time was um, yeah quite I've, just, I've mentioned the word emotional quite a bit but it was a real emotional moment and it was great to see them all and um, all their faces again and and it, and it was good then to meet the new guys um, so that was that was quite strange seeing them because I felt as though I knew them but I didn't know them until I actually got in the dressing room with them and got to meet them. So I remember the first thing, the first thing I said to him, I sat down on one of the seats down in the dressing room and said to him, uh, OK, right, before we go any further, park the football over there. You can talk to me. You've got any questions you want for me regarding COVID. So whatever we feel is all we want to get out in the open, let's open it up in the dressing room. Without going into the depth that we've gone to on this, I would have wanted to give them bullet points on being careful, looking after yourselves, because in turn you'll look after your family and your friends and your teammates. So we spoke about a few things down there and that was, they listened with great intent really and um, I thanked them all for that and then said to them, right, let's get on with the football now. And then we got, it was our third game again that week. And it was against Oxford, wasn't it? And Oxford had a, they had a clear week, didn't they? And um, I remember watching the game, we were doing okay. But I looked at the clock with 62 minutes on it and we'd gone. We'd, we'd just gone physically, we'd gone. It was just game after game, it was relentless for the boys. And we'd gone and I knew from the 62nd minute we were in trouble. 
and that was a day where they played like winners but the clock killed us that day and um, we couldn't do anything about that and then then we had we had the Ipswich game which was as nil nils go it was it was actually all right it was quite entertaining um, bit of a ding dong game which is the last thing we could have done with at the moment but it was very end to end but it was a good game for a nil nil so I was I was quite sort of pleased with the lads that they'd stopped that little losing run um, and then the last game of the season crew was another one where it had been it was a game too far um, started the game poorly and then got right back into it and then then a mistake at the end threw that game away but it was still good to get back and see them and also what I wanted to do was obviously throughout the period of time here you know there was going to be people that were going to leave and I just I needed to see them up close and personal see them in action and then I wanted to be the one to deliver what was going to be the bad news at the end of the day about them not staying here and I didn't feel as though that was a job for anybody else bar me you know I was going to be the ones that was going to make the decisions so I didn't want that to be Aaron you know I think that he'd done enough and I spent I remember spending all day with every player and I, I apologise to all of them for not being here to help them through the last few months, potentially to not have improved them because I couldn't. Um, and then said, sorry, but you know we're not going to move forward together anymore, really. But quite a few of them have got sorted out and I've had quite a few phone calls about a few of them that that I would say that I've given um, good recommendations to those people that have called me and I'm pleased to see a few of them, quite a few of them are fixed up. Hopefully they'll all get fixed up in the coming weeks. Um, so that was that was important for me to do that. I, I think that was more important for me to come back and speak to those players than it actually was the three games that I did attend because I wasn't quite ready to come back for them. I don't know if I'm quite ready yet, but I'm certainly further down the line, that's for sure. Yeah, pre-season's just started. The lads are in the thick of getting ready for the season ahead. Mm. How excited are you, one, for the start of the season, and, and two, to welcome the fans back to the stadium after a t an incredibly tough year for you and uh, yeah. well, 18 months? Well, let's start in reverse order. I mean, for the fans to come back, you know, that is just the best news ever. But throughout the country, not just for our club, throughout the country, you know, football fans need to be in stadiums. They, they need to be in there. The, the biggest thing for me, the fans, they, they do, and this is not to say players are dishonest, but what they do is they keep the players honest. They keep them honest. And that's what the support does at every club around the country. And, um, uh, you know, just to have them back and to have the atmosphere and all that. I just hope, I hope that uh, when they are back, it's done at the right times and everybody's going to be safe. Um, that is the most important thing. Whilst we look at the most important thing of fans being back in football, it is. But the most important thing is those fans that are ordinary people are fit and healthy and well and don't become poorly just by being fans again. That's the most important thing in, in all of this, in all of it, irrespective of what anybody else says. You know, you can. You you can't do anything without your health. You can't do anything. So, more importantly, it's about them being healthy. The fact that they can come back into football grounds again, and obviously they buy their season tickets and they buy merchandise, and that keeps the business running of the football club, which we all know is important. Um, more importantly, it's about everybody's health in this. Everybody's health. So that was the second question. The first one you said to me was about uh, the players coming back and working hard. Was that was Looking that first? forward to the season? Yeah, I just dragged that pre-season out a little bit longer. It just gives me a little bit more time. Um, the players won't like me saying about dragging pre-season out <laughs> longer because it has been really tough, really tough for them. Um, it will continue to be tough. There'll be lots of demands put on them. Uh, 
but that's what pre-season's about. You know, if you can get through pre-season and you don't miss a session and then you can get into playing those few games and you can get through the, those games. If you can get through those games and then the start of the season till August, September, where you've had a good block of football, the chances are you can go through the season then with no injuries, no muscle injuries. Obviously, there can be the bad ones that you can get, but that can happen at any time. So it's really important that they don't miss a session and they don't miss a day. And so far, so good. I mean, obviously, we're, we're missing Aaron and Ollie, who are on international duty, um, and Ethan just in this uh, little start has had, a, has had an injection um, in his hip. He'll be fine, but he's probably going to miss four or five days. Gaffer, I think I speak for everyone in the football world. It's absolutely fantastic to see you back. Have you got a final message, firstly, for, for the Shrewsbury fans and football wider world? Yeah, don't catch COVID. Um, final message. It's a difficult one that because I think we've been through a lot of what I would call final messages all the way through this this interview that we've done today. Um, I, I I would say that I, I, I still would hit on the vaccination again for people. If you haven't had it, I would say to you, please go and get it. And you know, I, I just think it is so important, you know, if if you if you have one of them it's something like eighty seven percent less chance of you getting it my god I, I wish they would have come around with those injections before i got it because it's a bit it's a bit late when you do get it so for those of you people that are not quite sure you, you if you get the symptoms for like 24 hours you know that that that's perfect you're not going to be the best for 24 hours but it's perfect that you get them and your immunities are up and you stay strong and you stay healthy and um yeah, I mean, it just for me, it's a bit like the other interview I do. It's it's a huge thank you to everybody out there for how how the public have been with me. Um, that has just been first class, really, absolutely first class. It's a real emotional time, a real emotional time, and when you've got responsibilities like everybody's got out there. You know whether it be family or work responsibilities or whatever, you know you you don't want to come away from them and um, you know having those isolation periods for a, a, a long time you've got to you've got to stay mentally strong you know for all those people that are that are at, that are at home now that are, you know they don't quite feel like they're getting better even though I'm sat here now I have them moments I have them moments you know. My watch stays on me permanently now because it will do my sats, my heart rate, all of those things. And I just need to check it every now and then when I feel I'm a little bit light-headed or I'm a little bit out of breath <clears throat> coming upstairs. E even talking to you guys, you know, we've done this for a couple of hours this morning. You know, it's almost like doing a training session because it's all about the breathing and um, you will have them ups and downs and we end up worrying sometimes about about the small things that once you go and see the specialist it's actually all right you're actually all right and some days <clears throat> I can talk and I can feel as though I'm really clear and I feel fine and my sats will be low my my blood oxygen will be low and you think well how does that work out and have another day where I where I feel as though I have asthma and I feel husky and I check my sats and I'm all right. So I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's more about staying strong through all of it, not being aware, but not worrying too much about the dips because you are going to come out of them and, you know, please look after yourself. It's really, really important. Um, don't take anything for granted uh, don't get fatigued at work while all this is around because this is when it might grab you I think that's why it grabbed me going back to the first thing I think that's why it's grabbed me so best wishes to everybody loads of love to everybody out there 
um, look after each other and um, let's look forward to the new season.